Thank you. Uh, I now call on Claire Hockey uh, to make her statement. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Across this chamber, I know there is commitment to creating a modern, inclusive Scotland which protects, respects and realises internationally recognised human rights. To help deliver this, I am pleased to set out today that we will undertake a review of the Mental Health Act, along with ongoing work on incapacity and adult support and protection legislation. This overarching review will examine the full legislative framework which supports and protects those with a mental disorder. People affected by profound mental health issues must have the same rights as everyone else. And this includes respecting the right to have a private and family life, protection from discrimination, as well as participating in those decisions which involve them. Presiding officer, the overwhelming majority of people accessing mental health care and treatment do so voluntarily. Very few people are ever treated for a mental disorder against their will. Where they are, it must be because it is necessary to protect them or to protect other people. And we need to be mindful as a parliament and as a society that this is at a time when they are very unwell and also very vulnerable. People with a mental disorder may also be subject to adults with incapacity or adult support and protection acts if they are at risk of harm or neglect. Depending on their needs, a person may be subject to one, two or all three of these acts. And this may be confusing for the individual and their carers and create barriers for them and to those caring for their health and welfare. While huge advances have taken place in mental health in terms of treatment and changing social attitudes, we have also been clear that we will continue to keep the changing context under review to ensure our laws are fit for purpose and, importantly, puts people at the heart of our legislation. In recent years, there has been an increasing focus in all areas of public life on the importance of protecting and promoting human rights and on recognising the rights of people with disabilities. The European Convention on Human Rights and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities have provided us with an opportunity to look again at our legislation to ensure that the rights and protections of those with a mental disorder are fully respected. Our legislation is already firmly based on rights and contains principles which reflect that ethos. It has never been found in part or whole by the European Court of Human Rights to be incompatible with its convention. But this doesn't mean we can't go further. At the time of its introduction, the Mental Health Scotland Act 2005 was a groundbreaking piece of legislation. It provided safeguards for those who became unwell and required compulsory care and treatment for a mental disorder. It also addressed wider issues such as the rights of service users and carers, as well as protection from abuse and ill treatment. The 2005 Act also focuses on what is most important and least restrict, most appropriate rather, and least restrictive for the individual patient, enabling them in some cases to be cared for and treated in the community rather than being admitted to hospital. It contains significant safeguards which, uh, such as the right to independent advocacy and an efficient and independent mental health tribunal which grants and reviews orders for compul compulsory treatment. Also an independent body, the Mental Welfare Commission, which monitors the use of the Scottish mental health law, including compulsory treatment, and has the power to intervene if there is evidence of improper care, treatment or practices. Fourteen years on, I believe the time is now right to look again at these laws to ensure that it reflects fully our ambitions and the needs of those whom it is intended to support when they most need it. The principal aim of the review of the Mental Health Act is to improve the rights and protections of persons with a mental disorder and remove barriers to those caring for their health and welfare. It will do this by reviewing the developments in mental health law and practice on compulsory detention and care, and care and treatment since the Mental Health Act 2003 came into force. Making recommendations that give effect to the rights, will and preferences of the individual by ensuring that mental health, incapacity and adult support and protection legislation reflects people's social, economic and cultural rights, including UNCRPD and ECHR requirements. And considering the need for the convergence of incapacity, mental health 
and adult support and protection legislation. But we're not starting this work from scratch. We have already started to take action. Work has already started on a review of incapacity law and practice, as well as a review of learning disability and autism under the Mental Health Act. We will also shortly be undertaking work on the Adult Support and Protection Act, which provides a framework for decision making that involves balancing human rights and risk. Work in a review of adults with incapacity legislation and practice has to date not yet considered in any detail matters relating to the crossover between adults with incapacity and mental health legislation or how these laws converge or the definition of mental disorder or its use as the gateway to intervention under the two pieces of legislation. These matters could not be considered in isolation from wider mental health legislation. And today's announcement of a wider review gives us the opportunity to consider all these matters together. Work in incapacity reform will also be carried out around improvements to practice that can be made without any legislative change, namely development of a supported decision-making strategy, improvements in training, support and supervision for guardians and attorneys, and training for professionals across health, social care and the law. Partners and stakeholders are vital to the success of this work and we will ensure that their contributions are at the centre of this work. On mental health law, we are already taking forward an independent review of learning disability and autism in the Mental Health Act, which started last year and is considering the wider issue of whether the current legislation needs to change for people with learning disability and autism. This independent review is not looking at individual cases, but reviewing the law and will be developing ideas on how to improve legislation if needed, so that it can, be, it can better support people's human rights. And it will report to me by the end of this year. This ongoing work then, taken together with the broader review of the Mental Health Act announced today, will mean that we now have a comprehensive programme of activity amounting to an overarching review of the legislative framework affecting people with mental disorder and those who care for them. Presiding Officer, I want to be clear that this work will be stakeholder driven and evidence led. We want to gather views from as wide a range of people as possible. Throughout the process, I am determined to ensure that the views of patients and those with lived experience and those that care for them are front and centre of this work to be taken forward so that they can help shape the future direction of our legislation. We need to work together in partnership to address issues that are affecting the lives of those with incapacity and mental disorder. The third sector in particular will be key to making this happen. They have a wealth of knowledge and understanding concerning the impact our legislation has on people's lives. We must all recognise the role we have to play and the importance of getting this right together. Presiding officer, the findings from each of these reviews I have outlined today will help to set the future direction of travel for our laws in this area. But it is, important that we, it is important that we do wait for the findings from all the individual pieces of work before drawing any conclusions. The review of the learning disability of learning disability and autism is also likely to recommend legislative change and that has potential to affect the overall legislative landscape. I hope that the review of mental health legislation that I have set out today is a further significant step towards ensuring that Scotland's legislative framework continues to lead the, the world. It demonstrates this government's ongoing commitment to considering the challenges, issues of human rights within mental health care settings and to ensuring that rights and protections of those that need it most are upheld. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. Can I ask members who wish to ask a question to, speak, to press the request to speak buttons now? I call Annie Wells to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. And I also welcome the Minister's announcement of an overarching review of the mental health and incapacity legislation. It is imperative that individuals are not disempowered when it comes to their treatment. As far as possible, patients should be able to make decisions about their own lives. Last year, someone came to me to discuss their experiences of compulsory detention and treatment many, many years ago. What was clear was the lasting impact this had had on their life and it is still causing considerable distress. So therefore, can I ask the Minister what consideration 
The review will give to a patient's aftercare should compulsory detention and treatment take place. Can I ask the Minister what consideration will be given to guidance around guardianship, which as we know figures are on the increase? And can I ask the Minister when will we hear the conclusion of this review, as well as a timetable for taking forward recommendations thereafter? Minister. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to hear that uh, Annie Wells um, is uh, welcoming of, of this uh, review of legislation, which I think is really important. As I said at the start of uh, my statement, um, I think this is something that unites the Chamber, and I think it's something that we should all be working together on. Um, if I could, she's asked me several questions there, so please forgive me if I miss any. Um, in terms of a conclusion, if I try to take the questions um, from the, the last one first, if we anticipate the review will take around a year. Um, I, however, it would be naive of me to be putting timescales on a review um, at, at the outset, but we're, we're anticipating that, that that would be the length of time. I think she makes some very important points there in terms of aftercare. I think it's we, um, it's important to remember that the vast majority of people who access mental health care do so on a voluntary basis. Um, and, but we do need to um, ensure that uh, the, the rights of all people who access mental health care are respected. Um, and uh, that will be certainly something that runs through the theme of, of our mental health legislation currently. And I would anticipate would, would continue to do so. Um, in terms of guardianship, Absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's really important that we ensure that uh, under our adults with incapacity legislation that we encourage people to think early about how they, uh, they settle their affairs and how they um, ensure that what they want is uh, respected when they are not in a, a position to be able to um, enact those wishes themselves and certainly uh, the, uh, the adults with incapacity legislation review and um, the uh, comprehensive programme that will be taken forward in terms of the non-legislative changes will look at additional training programmes, uh, will look at reviewing the guidance there and the codes of practice for uh, powers of attorney um, as well. David Stewart to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I thank the Minister for early sight of her statement. The Adults with Incapacity Act of 2000 and the 2003 Mental Health Act were groundbreaking at the time, but in light of current international human rights laws, they now look increasingly dated. Does the Minister share my view that the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a crucial uh, touchstone? Does the Minister share my view that the key question we need to ask about future policy legislation is, are we doing more to support people to take decisions for themselves, even if they have a mental illness, dementia or intellectual disability, and to give effect to these decisions? And the Minister understatement outlined improvements in practice to incapacity without the need for legislative change. Could the Minister provide the Chamber with more detail about the strategy, for example, in improvements in the training and support of guardians? Minister. Uh, yes, I, I, can, I can give, uh, again, Mr Stewart has asked me several questions in that question, so again, forgive me if I don't answer them all, and I would be happy to come back to him if, if I miss anything out that he has asked. Um, yeah, a significant piece of uh, feature of the work around the adult with incapacity uh, practice is the development of the supported decision-making strategy, and, and that aims to provide more support for people to make their own decisions about their life and care, in keeping with the, the UNCRPD, as he mentioned, and the findings of that review will enhance the work that we have going forward. Uh, in addition, as I, as I mentioned to Annie Wells, our, our first priority will be the revision to the codes of practice of power of attorney, and that work uh, will highlight the, the need for every adult in Scotland to consider appointing an attorney whilst they have the capacity to do so. Um, and it will provide information on the rights and responsibilities of attorneys and safeguards that are in place to protect individuals and the sanctions that can be imposed for the misuse of power of attorney um, and we believe that these changes uh, should make a substantive improvement to the delivery of services and the well-being of, of persons impacted by the AWI uh, legislation. Um, in terms of uh, his uh, reference to the NCRPD, yes absolutely I, I, I agree with him, it should be the touchstone for, for all that we do um, in terms of legislation and uh, my apologies I've 
think I think I've missed out one of these questions, but I will check back the official record and I will write to Mr. Stewart on that point. You could ask your sub. You could mention the one that you missed. What was the one you missed? <laughs> do you not know? Thank you don't yes, know. Yeah. Don't bother. Yes, I do, preside officer. I'm I'll very happy, you. as always, to have two bites at one cherry. Um, the final question I raised was that the minister made it clear in her statement that uh, we don't need legislation. We can look at changes. So, for ah. example... No, that's uh, fine. We're now... now thank you. <laughs> Presiding officer, yes, that was in terms of the adults with incapacity legislation, that we believe that there are improvements that we can do without uh, enacting legislation, and those are improvements that we can progress uh, uh, from now on. Flexibility. I, uh, I call Alison Johnson, followed by Alec Cole-Hamilton, please. Thank you. Um, the Minister is right to state that people affected by profound mental health issues have the right to, par to participate in decisions that affect them. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to ensuring that partners and stakeholders are at the centre of the review. Can the Minister outline how she will engage with those who will be most directly affected by any change in legislation, such as people class of, classed as adults with incapacity? Minister. Um, again, I uh, welcome Alison Johnson's uh, uh, support in the review of this legislation. Um, I actually feel that, uh, or, or believe that we actually have to have that lived experience voice right at the very heart of this review. Um, we do need partners, we do need stakeholders, but actually we need to hear the voices of those who have uh, been through uh, mental health uh, difficulties and, and access mental health services and their carers as, as well as partners and stakeholders. Um, we, as I, uh, we will be um, appointing a chair for the review very shortly and uh, while I wouldn't want to be um, preempting how they carry out that review within the parameters of, of what I've already set out today, um, it is key that stakeholders are sat around that table and that we tap into the, the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that they have, third sector organisations and healthcare professionals and, uh, and uh, various other organisations uh, which support people with mental health difficulties um, and ensure that their voices are there. Alex Cole Hamilton, followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Grateful for early sight of the statement. Also very grateful to see the moves to improve supported decision making, but that won't necessarily improve the, the ability with which we have to hear the voices of people affected by this legislation in the process. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities has raised several concerns about the overuse of curators in mental health tribunals. Can the uh, minister confirm that she'll ask that this review look at this area so that we improve the ability of people who come before these tribunals yeah, I'm going to be to heard have to, yeah, in their own words? Questions been asked, and, and I do want to get every in, so we'll need to have shorter questions and if possible shorter answers, please, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I think it's, it is important to, to say at the outset that there are already a number of safeguards under mental health legislation currently. The right to appeal, uh, detention, independent advocacy, and of course um, compulsory treatment uh, un, uh, under the Mental Health Review Tribunal, or is reviewed by the Mental Health Review Tribunal, and there's also the Mental Welfare Commission, um, which also safeguards rights. Um, but I, I, I don't um, disagree with uh, Mr Cole Hamilton that this is an area that should be looked at through. We're looking at mental health legislation right across the piece, for, not just for, uh, for those who access services informally, but also for those subject to detention. Um, and so I would expect that that would be an area that would be looked at under, um, under the review. James Dornan, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. As someone who's seen firsthand just how people used to be treated when they were involuntarily treated, I'm delighted to see so much has changed for the better and also delighted that the Scottish Government are holding this review. Clearly, there's still much more to be needed, is needed to be done to protect those vulnerable individuals. So, therefore, I'd like to ask the Minister if this review is going to consider the use of seclusion and restraint. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Dornan, uh, for that question. Part of the terms of reference for this review will consider the role of physical restraint, isolation and segregation. We are absolutely clear that everyone should be able to feel safe while receiving treatment or working in our mental health services and the use of physical restraint should only ever be a last resort. As we work to further improve our mental health services, the experiences of patients and their families and staff are key to shaping uh, treatment and support. 
Uh, the Mental Health Strategy commits to funding 800 additional mental health workers in key settings. And the, uh, importantly, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme for Mental Health has led to reductions in self-harm, seclusion, violence and aggression and restraint across a number of areas through collaboration and innovation from staff, service users and carers and the use of quality improvement and improvement science over the last six years. Miles Briggs, well by Emma Harper. Two years ago, the Health and Sport Committee suggested to SNP ministers that this review could take place and give Parliament appropriate time to take forward any legislative change. Given ministers are only today announcing this review, which will be potentially only included in the final programme for government ahead of 2021, and given this rushed legislation we could see, can I ask the minister when will she set out to Parliament a timetable at the earliest opportunity for how this can be progressed through Parliament? Minister. I, I thank you, Mr. Briggs, for that question. I, you know, the, um, when the Mental Health Legislation or the Mental Health Act was introduced in 2005, it increased the rights and protections for people with mental disorders. And since then, there have been huge advances that have taken place in relation to mental health in terms of treatment and the change in social attitudes. As I said in, in, in my statement, I think currently, uh, after 14 years after the introduction of that legislation, now is the time to be reviewing where, where we are at. Um, I answered a question earlier about uh, timescales in terms of when I expect this review to report. Um, I anticipate in 12 months' time, but I don't want to put firm timelines on that. I think it would be very naive of me to do that. It's a very complex piece of, of legislation which is going to encompass possibly several other pieces of legislation. It's important that we do this correctly and rushing something like this does not do this justice. Emma Harper followed by Mary Fee. Could the Minister confirm how the review will adopt a human rights approach to its engagement? Minister. Uh, when the Mental Health Act was introduced in 2005, it increased the rights and protections for people with mental disorders. Since then, huge advances have taken place in relation to mental health um, and in terms of treatment and changing social attitudes, as well as an increasing focus in all areas of public life on the importance of protecting and promoting human rights. Depending on their needs, a person could be subject to the Mental Health Act, the Adults and Capacity Act and the Adult Support and Protection Act. And we've already begun work to reform incapacity law and practice and we'll begin to work on the Adult Support and Protection Act. Um, a human rights based approach is about empowering people to know and to claim their rights and increasing the ability and accountability of individuals and institutions who are responsible for respecting, protecting and fulfilling rights. In our approach to taking this review forward, we will ensure that service users are involved in ways that make sure that their voices are heard on decisions that impact on them. Mary Fee, followed by Angela Constance. The scale of this review crosses many portfolios and is a massive task given the importance of the legislation already in place. And I welcome the response the Minister gave to Alison Johnson, but I wonder if the Minister could give any further details of what stakeholders and other agencies will be involved in the review process and who will oversee the work they do? Minister. Um, the, uh, the review process will have a chair appointed shortly um, and uh, the, I anticipate that the number of stakeholders involved within this, given the interest in this legislation, and as, as Mary Fee says, the number of portfolios that in this, this parliament this crosses, there will be a wide range of stakeholders involved in this. I anticipate this will be a, a, quite a, a, a large piece of work. Um, and so we, as I said to Miles Briggs, we need to ensure that we get this right. Um, and so I'm, I am unable to put some firm timescales around this because I think that would be uh, that was doing injustice to the work that that review body is going to do. Angela Constance, followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, as a former mental health officer, presiding officer, I uh, declare an interest and I very much welcome the, the overarching review. So, given the role of mental health officers in ensuring that people's rights uh, are protected and respected, particularly when compulsory care uh, or treatment is being considered, uh, I wondered if the Minister will take on board that despite uh, an increase in the number of mental health officers, that 22 local authorities uh, still report uh, a shortage of MHOs, and will the Minister commit to uh, some specific engagement uh, with mental health officers as a group of professionals? Minister. 
Well, as a former mental health nurse, uh, I uh, can uh, concur with uh, Angela Constance's uh, view of how invaluable mental health officers are in terms of uh, helping uh, the health NHS to provide the care and treatment that people with uh, mental distress and mental illness have. Uh, local authorities are responsible for ensuring there are sufficient mental health officers to deliver their statutory responsibilities and for planning their mental health workforce. Um, the Scottish Government has engaged with key stakeholders to consider possible approaches uh, to um, increasing MHO training and capacity linked to Action 35 of the Mental Health Strategy and work is being taken forward uh, under the uh, National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan. Thank you. Brian Whittle followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Actually, following on from Angela Constance uh, there, I think it's important that there is a capacity to implement any of the review findings and subsequent legislation. And, and with that in mind, uh, will this review uh, look at the considerable time pressures that our GPs and other HA, uh, healthcare professionals are under in their patient consultation that perhaps prohibit them from exploring uh, all potential treatment options and pot potentially the implementation of any review findings? Minister. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where Mr Whittle was going with his question there. I'm not sure if he was inferring that uh, people are detained under the Mental Health Act because of lack of other treatment options. I'm, I'm unclear about what he was asking there. Certainly this government has uh, shown that mental health is a priority. This Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport has assured this chamber that mental health is a priority. We have invested heavily in the workforce and we have invested in growing that workforce right across uh, all of the different uh, professions within mental health. And we've also uh, put substantial investment into primary care services and expanding the primary care team. Um, and I would expect that this review will take account of the changing landscape of staffing right across the health service and social care uh, when it comes back to us with its findings. Fulton McGregor, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Can the Minister outline what will happen to the Adults with Incapacity Reform work, which has currently been taken forward. Minister. Uh, we are proceeding with a comprehensive programme of non-legislative changes to practice and guidance. We are developing a strategy for supported decision-making to enable people with impaired capacity to have the support they need to make their own decisions about their life and care. We will provide a comprehensive training programme for professionals across health, social care and the law. And we are improving the provision of support for guardians and attorneys and we are revising the current codes of practice and guidance to provide clarity on the law as it stands. Um, as I said previously, our first priority will be the revision to the codes of practice on powers of attorney, and this work will highlight the need for every adult in Scotland to consider appointing an attorney while they have the capacity to do so. It will provide information on the rights and responsibilities of attorneys and the safeguards that are in place to protect individuals and the sanctions that can be imposed for the misuse of power of attorney. And could I take this opportunity, presiding officer, to encourage all MSPs in this chamber to uh, give consideration to appointing uh, a power of attorney while, while they have capacity to do so? I don't know if you're looking at me at the time, but certainly I hope not. I have no intention of doing it at the moment. Uh, if that was the inquiry, I called Daniel Johnson to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I remind the Chamber that I am currently a patient with Adult Mental Health Services an outpatient and have a diagnosed neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, there may be some concern from the autistic community today, given that the, the review work into autism is being linked with incapacity, especially when many within that community are seeking a move away from the deficit model. So could the Minister explain how the scope will be managed between acute and chronic conditions? And importantly, on the point around stakeholder-led uh, uh, nature of the review, confirm whether the review group into the review into learning disability and autism will include people with autism. Minister. Um, can I assure uh, Daniel Johnson that I, I want to make sure that the voice of people with lived experience is at the heart of this review. Um, I can understand some of his concern about uh, mental health legislation and, and capacity legislation. 
but certainly with adults with incapacity legislation, there is a crossover often. Um, while it does not affect everyone who comes into contact with mental health services, uh, but it, there, uh, there is a crossover sometimes in, um, of that, that legislation and sometimes also with adult support and protection. And so we're trying to ensure that the system is, will be easier to navigate, both for uh, people who are subject to some of the... Um, uh, some, some of that uh, of that law, but also for the, the people who are looking after them, for the healthcare and social care professionals here. But I, I take on board what, what Mr Johnson says, and I hope he take my reassurance that I want to make sure that the voice of lived experience is at the heart of this review. Last question, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that this overarching review will give both patients and families more support and protect, protection with regard to their human rights? Minister? Uh, this will be stakeholder driven and evidence led. Therefore, it's crucial that people have an opportunity to make their views known and there will be a full public consultation. Each stage of the process will have to create an engagement strategy, which is not only transparent, but also affords the opportunity to gather as wide ranging views as possible. The aim will be to engage people with real experiences, service users, carers and professionals, as well as those with a more academic interest. The third sector in particular will be key to making this happen. They have a wealth of knowledge and understanding concerning the impact of our legislation on people's lives. Thank you. That concludes uh, questions on the statement of a short suspension to allow the front bench to change places for the next item of business.